Olá! <laughs> Olá! Hi, everyone! Uh, we are back to our second online meetup, this time with Manuel Lima. But before Caroline uh, presents him to you, I just want to mention uh, that we create this meetup to bring together, together people from different backgrounds uh, to share knowledge, inspiration and news uh, in the field of data visualization. So keep joining us and I will give the word to Caroline. Yeah, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, who didn't know him, that's uh, Manuel Lima. Manuel Lima has over 50 years of experience designing digital experience and leading product teams of companies like Google Code Academy, Microsoft Nokia, RGNA, and some more. Manuel spent also uh, kind of six years in Lisbon where he studied industrial design, which was an important foundation in his life. Now he's living in New York from where he shares his knowledge at Parsons School of Design. We are great webinars, giving talks, as a leading voice of information visualization as well. And Manuel is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and founder of Visual Complexity Com, and currently senior UX manager at Google. He mentioned the data, a data policy podcast I just listened to. What he wants to do with the rest of his life is communicating his knowledge and inspire people. Books are the reflection of that passion that he has uh, for knowledge, as I know now. <laughs> For that, he just released a third book, uh, The Book of Circles. We are super pleased that you share with us your passion for the knowledge and take us with you into the linguistic world of data visualization. And everybody who has a question can add this as a comment. Um, he will answer it at the end of the talk. And he just um, gave us a short notice that this talk will be a bit longer as we expected, but it's totally worth to stay with us and Manuel, the stage is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you, can you guys hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Should be good. All right. Hopefully, you can see my screen that I'm sharing at the moment. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today uh, in this virtual talk. Um, and thanks so much for the kind introduction. Sarah and Caroline. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the language of data visualization and why you might think of data visualization, the practice of data visualization, as a language in its own right. So in order to do this, this is some of, some of the topics we're going to cover in this session today. We're going to briefly talk a little bit about what are the building blocks of a language. Uh, we're going to look at the grammar of data visualization, uh, understanding a little bit of the data, some of the data types that some of you might be familiar with uh, as well. And then also briefly talk about uh, how can we actually choose a visualization, right, based on the data that we might have. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with a little short segment on the diversity, the multidisciplinary range of data visualization. All right, so let's get started. So imagine that today an alien would land on planet Earth, right? And this alien is a very curious individual, as it should be, being intelligent enough to actually travel all this long to, to land on our planet. So the first thing he asks is, what is a cat? Right? It's an intriguing question. What is a cat? I heard about this, this, this animal, this, this species. What is a cat? Now imagine the range of answers that you would get, right? Uh, imagine the amount of different ways you could describe a cat, right? Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty large range for sure. Well, if you were smart enough, you would probably just go with the official uh, uh, description of what a cat is, right? You would just open up a dictionary and try to convey to the alien what a, the definition of a cat, right? The official definition of a cat. And then you would go something like a small domesticated mammal with soft fur, a short snout, and retractable claws. Now, do you think that's going to be enough for the alien to actually understand the concept of a cat? Probably not, right? It leaves a lot of space for ambiguity. And, you know, maybe the alien in his, in his own mind thinks of a cat as something like this, right? So 
perhaps you could try a different approach altogether. Instead of actually going with the official description, you would look for specific words, right? Descriptors that can define a cat, right? So you could say that the cat is a killer, is a predator, is wild, is agile, is playful. But, you know, and there's of course many, many different words you could use, descriptors. But even some of these words are kind of mutually exclusive, right? It would be actually slightly confusing to the alien to understand what a cat is if on one hand you say it's, it's an agile animal, but also it's lazy, right? Lazy and agile don't quite go together, right? They are opposite ends of a spectrum, it seems. So this could be even further confusing the alien instead of helping define what a cat is. And then, of course, this would only make sense if the alien would actually be able to read the words, the descriptors that you are providing, right? If the alien was able to understand the building blocks of a system we call the alphabet, right? And not just understanding the building blocks, the individual elements, but also the rules for combining those elements in a meaningful way, right? what we call grammar. Of course, if this alien was to land somewhere else on planet Earth, let's say in, in Casablanca, Morocco, it would be a whole different challenge altogether, right? Now, all of a sudden, this alien would have to learn a whole different system of building blocks and a different set of rules for combining these building blocks, right? And these are, in fact, just two alphabets of many, many known alphabets across the planet. According to some estimates, there's more than 370 living alphabets that are alive today, right? A pretty striking number. And uh, this is actually a great diagram created by Edward Bernard in 1689 that's tried to capture visually all known alphabets and its various symbols and, and visual metaphors. And then, of course, you would have to exclude all alphabets that are no longer with us, right? Alphabets that are no, not spoken anymore or written anymore because they are long gone by ancient civilizations. The most fascinating one is probably this one. This is actually called the proto-writing system. This is the, the system that led to the first known alphabet, the Sumerian cuneiform. And these are actually a set of clay tokens, as they call it. These are three-dimensional objects that carried a lot of meaning and information with them, right? And then slowly, over time, these clay tokens, these physical objects, became more and more abstract into what led to the oldest known alphabets that's roughly 6,000 years old, known as the Sumerian cuneiform, right? And you can see in the image on the right how the evolution of this alphabet occurred, right? From a very sort of pictorial type of representation in the early stages of its development to a much more abstract uh, visual representation of the alphabet. So this could be, of course, one approach, right? Explaining what a cat is by using a system of symbols, right? Our read as we know of an alphabet, right? So, but you know what? The alien gets tired of this approach pretty quickly. It's like, this is not working for me. This is too complicated. These humans are actually more complicated than I thought. So he tries a different approach. It, now he asks the following, can you actually draw me a cat? instead of explaining what a cat is by using words and symbols, can you actually draw me a cat? Do you think the range of approaches would be larger or smaller than the ones using an alphabet, using a writing system? Would be at least equal in terms of, of its plurality and in terms of, of its diversity, right? You can think about the you know, hundreds of ways that you can use to visualize, to map and draw a cat. I love to show this diagram because these actually show a full range of possibilities by one single person alone. Of course, this person is not just an ordinary person. This is Pablo Picasso. But you actually see here, again, the full range of possibilities of visual depiction in one single drawing. And he's actually drawing a few sketches of a bull. And what I love here is that you have a very type of realistic bull on the bottom left. And then on the, on the top right of that same page, you have the opposite, a very stylized, 
abstract representation of a bull, right? And we humans, we still see bull in all of these individual representations, right? But it shows a full range of approaches from like the very realistic representation, almost like the clay tokens, the physical objects, all the way down to this abstract, stylized representation that you can still understand what it stands for, right? And then of course there, you know, you Picasso has done other things, you know, such as exploring individual elements of that, that being, in this case, the bull, you know, by using the head uh, or different aspects of, of its body. Now imagine what it would be like to actually understand what hundreds and thousands of people across the world, how they actually envision and draw different objects and different concepts. Right? It's a fascinating idea. And it's not just something that lives as a desire. You can actually look it up. Uh, this was actually a project by Google launched a few years back. It's called Quick Draw. It's a fascinating project. And they actually showcase, I think, roughly 50 million drawings on every single concept you can imagine. You know, people are asked to draw planes, watches, an ambulance, a ball, a tomato, a book, a bad, you know, you name it. Like every single concept you can imagine, people have been asked to draw. And again, from a social science point of view, it just said a plethora of knowledge here because you can really try to understand the nuances that people use to visualize, right, to, to represent all these different concepts. And the goal, of course, here is actually to train a machine, an AI machine, that this is actually part of a game that Google put together. That has, And this is super fun, by the way. You should do it on your own. Or if you have kids, you should give them a try as well. Uh, it's a really cool project because as soon as you start drawing anything, the system tries to guess what you are actually drawing, right? As soon as you draw the first line, they start guessing, right? Is this a picture? Is this a spreadsheet? Is this a jail? <laughs> and so on and so on. And it's basically using thousands and thousands of drawings that people have made all across the world to, again, be able to put this game together. So now let's, again, focus on the, the question from our alien, right? The cat question. Like, can you draw me a cat? So what are you actually looking at? are one, more than 100,000 cat drawings made by real people all across the internet, right? And again, this would be impressive for the alien to actually consume, right, as a, as a visual representation of a cat. And as soon as you look at this broad range of approaches, you can immediately pinpoint some archetypes, right? This is actually part of a great article that a friend of mine, Ian Johnson, put together, where he identifies some of the main sort of typologies or models or, or archetypes of this specific drawing of a cat. And of course, you can see how many people on one group try to do a very simplistic, just a circle and a, and a two pointy ears that kind of like identify the cat. Others in the middle try to add a little bit more nuance and details to the, to the, to the face of the cat. And others on the third column try a whole different approach, right? They don't care, care so much about the face of the cat. They, it's more about the body, the silhouette of the animal itself. And cat, you might argue that cat is not one of the hardest things to draw, right? We have seen so many cats, of course, in real life and in cartoons and so on, that we are very familiar with the shape of it. But how would you actually go about drawing you know, things that are a little bit more ambiguous. Concepts like camouflage is actually one that they, they cover in this, in this Google project, Quick Draw. These are actually more than 150,000 camouflage drawings. And I love the range of approaches because, you know, some think about camouflage as, of course, as a, as a pattern in, in clothing, right? So you see a lot of t-shirts and pants and so on. But others try to actually create the, the essence of camouflage, right? By actually creating the pattern on its own. And some are just all over the place. You don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> That's like, and you, you see that a lot in like these very ambiguous terms. But imagine if you were to actually told to draw something even more ambiguous, you know, concepts like charity, coldness, compassion, elegance, generosity, humility, humor. How would you even go about rep visually representing some of these concepts? It's extremely, extremely hard, right? 
or apparently the hardest of all <laughs> appears to be BlackBerry. I love this <laughs> example because BlackBerry apparently is a, is a really hard concept for people to, to visually represent. So, of course, it is the ambiguity that it comes with the type of BlackBerry that you are referring to. You know, it could be the fruit, but it could also be the, the mobile device. But a BlackBerry is, of course, a very small fruit, as of course all of you know. But if you look at it, it's actually really, really complex in its buildup. It's not just like drawing an, an orange, right? And I love how people just get fed up with trying to draw all the different individual elements. Like some of them actually re resemble grapes and they just do like childish scribbles. They just, like, <laughs> they don't even care. Like this is too complex for me to draw a single Blackberry. So they just, they just do like this crazy scribbles all over the place. So it's really fun. So we looked a little bit about this, again, this diversity that it can take by either drawing or representing a blackberry or a cat, right? So normally in some of the workshops, I like to put people through this challenge of like drawing quantities. And it's tough in a, in a setting like this one to actually engage with the audience so much. But imagine that if you were told uh, this specific question, specific challenge, right? In how many ways could you visually represent these two quantities being seven and 14. How many ways do you think it's possible? Okay. I've done this several times and uh, I can tell you that the most appropriate answer is not a specific number, right? It's not so much like there's maybe five ways so there's 10 ways and there's no more ways you could do it. It's the right answer is likely close to infinite, right? Because the more time you have to visually represent these two quantities, it's, you could just go Ad infinitum, right? It just you could just go in this long tail of approaches that it's never ending. Okay, so it's really almost close to infinite. In the same way, for you to describe a cat, right? You could really describe a cat in, in almost infinite ways, right? By combining those those building blocks. So of course, when you think about two quantities again, in this case seven and fourteen, the first thing that comes to mind is the the numerals, right? The Arabic numerals that we use seven and fourteen. But you can think about those as already being visual representations of a quantity. You're using a numeric system, but there are other numeral systems that exist today and have existed in the past, right? You could use, of course, a, a Roman numeral system. You could even use a Sumerian numeral system and many others, right? Or you could actually try to come up with graphics that represent quantities. You could have seven boxes all lined up or 14 boxes, and that's a representation of a quantity or bars, right, as we use them so often in bar charts. But there's, of course, a plethora of approaches you could take, right? You could have little flags as representations of quantities. You could have a, a pie chart, which is, you know, a pie chart is such a, a fascinating object because everyone can relate to the subdivision of a pie, right? A subdivision of a cake, of a circular cake. And you can think about that subdivision in quantities, of course, right? And you can map those to two specific quantities, in this case being seven and 14. Size would, of course, be another one, right? Size seven, size 14. The, there's so many approaches. This is actually part of a great article by another friend of mine, Santiago Ortiz, who wrote an article called The 45 Ways to Communicate to Quantities. And Santiago is the first to admit that with more time, there's, of course, many more than 45 quantities. But these are just some of the ones that he has explored in this fascinating article. You could map, of course, quantities to the different phases of the moon, right? And that could be a visual representation of those 7 and 14. Watch, right? The time is an obvious mapping of quantities, right? This could be 7 p.m. or this could be 14 hours, right? So 2 p.m. You could actually use a variety of different ways to, to map quantities in a visual way, right? From again, from size to the arc, uh, to different wavelengths and, and different angles of waves, even smiley faces. I mean, you could easily put together a survey uh, evaluating customer happiness, for, for example, and you could map, a, you could have a spectrum of happiness from zero to 20, where seven would be not so happy and 14 would be not super happy, but getting close to very happy, right? So you could actually use visual representations in a variety of different ways, in a really, really rich way. So 
as we saw, as with language, as with the written language, you can combine these building blocks in so many different ways to create the most sophisticated piece of poetry and represent any type of concept. The same thing you can argue with graphics, right? Graphics being these building blocks that you can use by applying different size, shape, color, right? And represent a variety of different quantities, a variety of different data points and information. And as Jack Bertin said so well, graphics is a strict and simple system of science which anyone can learn to use and which leads to better understanding. In other words, data visualization is a language, right? It's a system for communication. So now that we kind of saw how data visualization is a language in its own right, now let's look at the specifics, the rules for combining these elements, right? The rules for combining these building blocks, the grammar of data visualization. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. This is, of course, an idea that's been with us for, for quite some time, but Aristotle was really the first one to mention this back in the fourth century BC. But it was really through the work of the Berlin School of Experimental Psychology in the early 20th century that this idea, this notion became ingrained in society, in cultural, in culture, and in our own, of course, minds, right, as individuals, in what became known as Gestalt psychology. And Gestalt essentially proved that the operational principle of the brain is ultimately holistic, or in other words, it is irreducible. What does that mean? One of the most famous experiments that they put together is called the Gestalt effect. And it basically shows that the recognition of shapes and forms on a human brain is not based on the collection of elements, thoughts and lines, but on seeing them as a fully identifiable pattern. Right? And this holistic approach is why for most humans, it's really easy for us to detect a dog, a Dalmatian dog, in this image. But for many machines, even today, it is actually pretty hard to do that. Another thing that Gestalt gave us through this fascinating work on and, and exploration of the human brain were a series of principles or laws, the laws of Gestalt, that we can apply on a variety of, of design-related fields, including data visualization. And I'm going to talk to you about two specific but super fundamental laws of Gestalt. The first law is the law of similarity. It tells us that elements that are similar are perceived to be more related than elements that are dissimilar. Right? So you first look at the three columns on the right side. You look at the three columns, right? But when you look at each individual column, Immediately, your brain detects two varieties within each column. There's small and large circles. There's blue and gray circles on the central column. And finally, there's circles and triangles in the last column. Immediately, you detect that difference. This is, again, the law of similarity in action. You immediately group these things together and detect the distinction. And this, of course, can be explored by many designers as it has over the ages. So this is a Simple, simple example of a mobile UI where color, in this case, is associated with specific categories of content, right? And as soon as you are going down your feed and you run into a piece of content, the color is going to be an indication of what category, category it belongs to, right? Color, of course, as an indication of categories is super important in data visualization in a bar chart, as you see on the top, right? That you have different types of products represented by color or in a pie chart that you see uh, on the bottom, right? Again, color being indicative of the type of object of the category of object. And this can be applied both to simple objects, simple graphics, as you have, of course, on the, on the, on the left side or really complex ones on the right. Notice how he, here, this is a, a fairly complex chart created by Martin Wattenberg uh, more than 10 years ago. This is actually a visualization of all the moves by two different chess, play, chess players. 
and you understand these are two individual chess players by color alone, right? So in your head, in your mind, you are immediately grouping. And notice how not even all the traces are the same, have the same color, right? There's a range of like yellow to orangey. But because they are similar, your brain associates and groups those things together. So you, immediately you detect the top player, the orangey, yellowish player on the top, and the green player on the bottom, right? And you can understand the flows just by the mechanism of color, primarily in this specific visualization. Color is one. We talked about also size and shape. The example on the left is an interesting one. They're using shape. This is a, this is a really a double chart. And notice how it's not using color at all. This is, I think, I believe this is actually a, a GDP uh, visualization, the, the, the GDP of countries around the world. But your mind detects patterns automatically based on size alone, right? Immediately, you detect two large players, US and China. Then you detect roughly six or seven kind of medium-sized players. And then the rest, right? Following into the periphery, kind of like following in this, this unknown. And this is again using size, not using color, anything else. Size is the only thing that is communicating data in this specific chart. The example on the, on the right is a really interesting one. Networks are immensely hard to visualize. And I love this example by Santiago Ortiz that's using different shape and color to represent nodes. And again, by the law of similarity, you immediately identify similarities between these nodes, right? By, again, shape and color, right? You, you group the blocks together, you group the videos, there's like tweets, there's Wikipedia articles, there's emails. So your mind automatically identifies those, those similarities and groups them together. So this is the law of similarity. Now, the second law, you have to remember this. This is the most important law you will learn today. It's called the law of proximity. And it tells us that elements that are close together are perceived to be more related than elements that are further apart. So if you look at the image on the right side, yes, you do detect there's nuances. There's distinction between, again, a triangle, blue triangle and a gray circle. But it's not as relevant as the proximity, right? So what the brain actually detects first is there five different groups of things? And then you look at the details of those things. But the grouping, the proximity, right, the, the, the location is what comes first. And the law of proximity is super critical in design overall. This is an example of, of a mobile UI where uh, two controls for plus and minus are put side by side, right? And by being, being put side by side, you perceive them to be related to be somehow controlling the same spectrum, the same system, same interaction. If you had the plus button on the very top left, right, and the minus on the top bottom, do you think you're going to have the same perception? Probably not. You wouldn't perceive those two things to be related, to be this, the two controls of the same experience, right? So again, proximity is critical. And proximity can be done really wrong as well. This is actually when when usability issues fall into place. This is an example of, of Concur. I always don't like to talk about Concur because I have only bad things to say about the interface and I always care that someone working for Concur is in the audience. <laughs> so this is actually a screenshot that I took, I think when I joined Google and I've used Concur in other large corporations. It's, it's a tool that many companies use to to take care of expenses. You know, when you go on a, on a tr business trip, you basically accumulate a set of expenses and receipts. And this is a tool that helps you create a report of the, all the expenses that you, you did. Um, and it's not a very intuitive one, right? So I remember as I was typing all these uh, details for my, for my trip, I filled everything. And then I was like, what's next? Like, where should I be clicking to go to move to the next stage? And I couldn't find anything. And you notice on the very bottom right, there's actually a next button right there. But it's so lost. It's so detached, again, from the, the main experience that you lose the idea that these are somehow connected, right? They are related. It almost looks like a footer that you kind of dismiss altogether as something that's secondary or tertiary to the main experience. And this is, again, the law of proximity done wrong. 
Well, the law of proximity can also go wrong in real life. <laughs> this is an example I love to share because it's so symptomatic of how important the law of proximity is. It really supersedes everything else, right? And all of a sudden, instead of reading no smoking safety first, you read no safety smoking first. <laughs> Again, purely based on the proximity of the words, nothing else. You can notice here how they even try to reinforce the change, the, 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 the correspondence of the words by using color, right? No smoking is, is red and safety first is black, but it doesn't matter. You could use the same type, you could use the color, you could use all these variables, but the law of proximity supersedes everything else. So this is actually something really, really important for you to remember, how important this specific law is. And of course, you can see it in practice in data visualization in, in many different ways. Scatterplot is the most obvious chart that really leverages uh, the law of proximity. So in the scatterplot that you see on the left, it doesn't really matter the color per se, or even the shape that you're using to represent those individual data points. It's all about proximity. It's identifying those clusters, those groups of things, right? For you to understand patterns, for you to understand correlation, right? And hopefully causation as well. Or the example on the right, in this case, color matters, but it doesn't really, it just adds more flavor to it. This is actually a map of, of the political blogosphere uh, in the US, I think done maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And immediately you detect two, two massive ups of all interconnected, right? But then of course, as soon as you had color, you kind of understand these are of course, Democrat and Republican blogs, but you could still use it with no color and you would still understand the inherent structure of this specific system. So we covered Gestalt and the two primary laws. There are many other laws if you want to delve into Gestalt. I'm always amazed by how designers still today can leave college, myself included, uh, without having learned Gestalt in a really uh, fundamental way because it drives so many good best practices when it comes to design. But Gestalt was, of course, not the only foundation for data visualization, for us to understand the grammar of data visualization. The next player here was really Donis Dundas. This She put together this book, The Primer of Visual Literacy, that actually exists in many different design programs across the world. Beautiful book. What I love about this book is that she actually goes the opposite way of Gestalt, right? Gestalt tries to prove that the human brain is irreducible, that we see things as a fully identifiable pattern. Instead, Donis tries to identify all the individual elements that make a composition, what she calls the skeletal visual force. So essentially she goes after paintings like this one by Van Gogh and, and, or any type of visual communication, it could be a graphic design poster, etc. And she tries to get, again, the building blocks of that piece, you know, things that she identified as the dot, the line, shape, direction, the tone, right? The color, the texture, movement, etc. And by combining these things, painters, designers, and artists over the centuries have been able to create this perception of a variety of different things on humans, right? Things like complexity, distortion, depth, just a position, randomness, sharpness, harmony, balance, symmetry. All these things are created by a good combination, by an appropriate combination of these individual building blocks, right? What she calls the skeletal visual force. So Don is had a huge important influence in, in this field of data visualization. But arguably the most important one was really Jack Bertrand, who in 1967 took a lot of the foundational work done by Don is, right? In identifying those individual variables and he mapped those variables to data. And that was a huge explosion in the field because now we identified the seven main categories of visual variables, variables that you can use, right? And those are position, size, shape, value, color, orientation, and texture. What you might call the visual encoding of data or the visual encoding of information. 
What I love about this is that if you look at the variables that uh, Bertrand created, all of these fall into the two original laws by Gestalt, right? The variable of position, such an important one, still today the most accurate one, is all about the law of proximity, as we, as we just uh, saw. And all the others, from size to shape to color to texture, fall into the law of similarity, right? As we just saw as well. Then, of course, came the notion of visual accuracy. And this was done by William Cleveland and Robert McKeel. They took uh, Bertrand's work to a whole different level by considering, by placing his original variables into a spectrum of accuracy. And a lot of research has been done, of course, over the years on this, that position is still to this day the most accurate of all the variables. And then, of course, you have uh, other types of position, length, direction and angle. There's a little bit of error. So with volume and area, and then color, right? People are curious about why is color such an inaccurate way of representing information. And it's, it becomes pretty clear once I show you this slide. Uh, and also the importance of accessibility, right? So what you have on the left side is a famous, you know, a, a regular heat map that you see in many different ways, in, in, in many different sort of, uh, situations, going from dark green to dark red. Now you have on the right side the same heat map seen by a person with detronopia, which is a type of color blindness that actually affects roughly 10% of US men. So still a considerable amount of the population suffers from this condition. And that's why color is something that you should treat very carefully. It can lead to a lot of problems like this one. And it's also, according to McKeel, not the most accurate way of representing data. Right, so now we just went through, right, the grammar of data visualization. Right, the grammar, the, the different types of graphics, and how to combine those variables. Right, now we're going to talk a little bit more about data and the challenging of understanding data. This is a very sort of simple way of looking at data, but hopefully it's going to be something that it can it can resonate with you. So. I think I, I'm old enough to remember going to school libraries and, and those things. And uh, there was no computer that you could search for a title. <laughs> you would actually tell the librarian which book you wanted. And the librarian had this index cards, right, where you basically look for the right title. And these index cards are fascinating objects because these are, again, almost like this old clay tokens you saw from Sumerian times, these are physical representations of data, right? They have all the data points. And a card like this would normally have things like the title of the book, the author, the publisher, the CD, the year it was published, a set of different data points on the specific volume, right? It would allow to actually distinct this uh, volume from others. But of course, when talking about data, if you were to actually create a data set about, you know, with all these different index cards, the best thing would be to just put it on a spreadsheet. And for, again, for simplicity's sake, when we talk about data, right, it's basically comes in this format. It's a table or a spreadsheet, right? And this table or spreadsheet that, of course, all of you are familiar with by using Excel or Google Sheets and, or any other, normally is comprised of three of, of two elements, sorry. You have columns, right? These are also known as fields, variables, or attributes of your collection, right? In case you have a collection. You could keep on adding columns to a never-ending degree. You could actually make your own columns. You could make your own attributes of your collection. And then the rows are the records, right? The observations, the objects that you're trying to sort of collect, that you're trying to sort of uh, make sense of archive, in this case, books. The intersection of a row and a column is what we call a data point. Right? In this case, it's it's a genre mystery for a specific item in your, in your collection. This is what we call a data point. And all of these together is what we normally call a data set. 
right? And sure, there are more complex data sets. You know, there are relational data sets that are actually made up of multiple tables. There are three tree and network data sets, but I think we can actually bypass all of them because in the vast majority of cases, when we talk about a data set, we talk about one single individual table. And if you look attentively at this, this table, it's made up of two types, qualitative or categorical items and quantitative or numerical items in your collection, right? So this, we start understanding the different types of data that exist, right? On one side, you have categories. These are categories or labels for things on your data set. And then you have quantities or numbers. You could, of course, further subdivide this, right? Categorical goes into nominal and ordinal. Quantitative goes into interval and ratio. But interval and ratio is actually, I love this one because it's actually a really <laughs> intriguing one. I once saw this quote by Monica Wahi, who was actually a statistics professor. And this is what she wrote. I teach a basic statistics class and I have trouble explaining how to tell if a continuous variable is an interval or a ratio variable. So there's, of course, nuances, but it's still actually for, uh, for most people really hard to actually explain and understand what that difference is. So for sake of simplicity, I'm going to keep this lecture around three different data types, nominal, ordinal, and quantitative. Nominal is the most obvious. When we say apples and oranges, that's a nominal type, right? Uh, another type is citizenship. Right, it's another type of, of the typical category that we know of. Right, there's no, there's no quantitative value. Right, there's no order specific that's relevant for these categories. Right, types of vegetables, types of fruits, easy ones. Ordinal is a really intriguing one. It's still a category, right, in the sense that it's not a quantity. Right, it's not quantifiable, but in this case, th the order matters tremendously. A great example is let's say that you are you know, uh, making an archive of T-shirts and you are actually plotting uh, T-shirt sizes, right? Small, medium, large. These are not quantities, right? They are, they are still qualities, but the order of those things matters quite a lot, right? Same thing, movie ratings is another example. A pain scale or a happiness scale. Let's, let's say that you are doing a happiness scale or a customer satisfaction scale. So those are all ordinal quantities, right? Sorry, ordinal uh, uh, categories. And then finally, you have quantitative. These are continuous metrics or counts that are expressed as numbers. You know, think about the length, the size, also sales, number of users, KPIs, you name it. So this was just an important sort of overview of data. Because now we're going to look very briefly about how to choose a visualization, right? And we went over the visual variables, right? We understand position, size, shape, value, the things that are trumpet together, right? Identifying the, those building blocks. And we also just looked at data types, nominal, ordinal, and quantitative. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could actually merge these two things together to better understand how you can actually visualize things better? As it turns out, that's exactly what, what Jock McKinley did in 1986 when he put together this diagram that I absolutely love. And I'm going to show you, this is the original one, but this is actually a, 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 just an adaptation of that original diagram. I love this one because it actually shows the example, so it's easier if you are a visually oriented person, as I'm assuming you are, by just being on this <laughs> talk alone. And now you look at, it's a list of variables by the different data types. Again, quantitative, ordinal, and nominal. Look at some interesting patterns here, right? Position is across all three of them, the most accurate, as we talked about that as well, right? The law of proximity. But notice how things change. Like notice how color is on the bottom of quantities. And, and it makes sense, right? You, want, you don't want to map quantities like seven and 14 by using different shades of color. Like who would really make sense of that? That would be pretty hard to, to understand. But now color, when it comes to nominal, when it comes to categories, it actually takes second place. And it's actually one of the most common ways of depicting categories. And we saw, again, examples of that, right? So it's really interesting. 
And here, I love this example. Uh, this is actually, you can, you can actually download the PDF. Uh, it's on the, the, the URL, it's at the very top right of the screen. It's called xperception.net. It's kind of a tongue twist there. What I love about this PDF, it's actually a long PDF. This is just the, the very top of that PDF, is that they actually suggest the different chart types based on the data types that you have, right? So if you have discrete categories, if you have continuous metrics, they provide a various different charts that could actually be relevant to what you're trying to map. So I love this as a reference. It's really a great example of putting the two things together. But then, of course, you could argue that sometimes it's not only about the specific data types that you have. Sometimes you have a very specific idea of what you want to show, right? Maybe you want to show, you want to compare a set of values, you want to show relationship, maybe you want to show distribution over time, or sometimes even the, the kind of the show the various parts of the data that comprise the whole. So these are if you actually want, if you, if you know what you want to show, there's a variety of different frameworks that you can use. I'm going to show you some of them here very briefly. We are kind of running out of time. But I can actually send an email, and I'm sure Sarah and Caroline would be kind enough to share with you uh, the links to many of these frameworks. So the beauty about these frameworks is that they are easy to consume, right? They start off with the question, what do you want to show, right? And then maybe if you want to show comparison, they show you this plethora of possibilities, right? There are many of these things. There's this one called Chart Guide. This is one of my favorites. It's by the Financial Times. Uh, you can actually find it straight away at ft.com slash vocabulary. And they have a lot more types of, of, uh, of sort of things that you want to map that are really useful. You could, a lot of these things are also downloadable as PDFs and posters. The Graphic Continuum is another great one, another great framework. We actually have... Uh, in our Google office when we used to, to go there in person, we have this specific poster, the graphic continuum, which is the same idea, right? If you know what you want to show, if you want to show a distribution over time or a part to all relationship, it just shows all possibilities of graphs so that you can actually make an appropriate uh, selection. Or these three, I mean, these three are by far my favorites. These are so, so amazing. The DataViz project, uh, DataVizProject.com, DataVizCatalog.com. These are great because they are all, uh, actually all interactive. The first one, the DataVizProject.com, you can actually select the different data type you have. You can, there's multiple filters, there's multiple ways you can actually browse the different charts. So if you are having issues about selecting the right chart for what you want to communicate, these interactive uh, uh, reference guides are super, super helpful. So I really encourage you to go there. And finally, I want to end up with the, the final segment of today on the topic of the diversity of data visualization. <clears throat> so as we saw before, right, just a simple cat can be explain and visualize in a variety of ways, right? Now imagine a city as complex as New York. How many different ways can you map the city and visualize the city? The answer is, again, close to, to infinite. And I always go back to this specific quote, uh, a map is not a territory, right? Those are very different things. And I'm going to show you why that is. I love showing in this context this specific painting uh, the Great Wave of Kanagawa, arguably the most famous Japanese painting of all time. But what's interesting about this painting is many people, even though they know this, of course, this is one of the items that it's become a really a, a house name for many of us across the world. Um, but what many of us don't know is what is the main subject of this painting? Some people might think it's the tsunami, right? This big wave crashing. Uh, maybe it's the struggleman, the, the fisherman's struggle with the, with the sea. As you can see, a few boats there kind of, kind of trying to stay afloat. But the main subject of this painting is actually Mount Fuji that you see in the very foreground of the painting, the highest mountain in Japan. And in fact, this painting 
is part of a series called the 36 views of Mount Fuji. 36 views of Mount Fuji. Done in the early 20th century, where you see paintings showing Mount Fuji seen from the cities, from the plains, from the mountains, from the villages, from the fields, from the ocean, right, as we saw. It's almost like they are trying to map this incredible structure in a 360 sort of uh, uh, camera, right? Like trying to map it from every single possible angle. So I love this analogy because in many ways, I think you should look at any data set, or the data set you're trying to map as your own specific Mount Fuji. And there's countless ways for you to visualize it. I'm I, I normally show this project. This is called the Internet Mapping Project. And every once in a while, I, there's an article on the media saying this is the ultimate map of the Internet. This is what the Internet looks like. And it shows some of these things, like just like this one. And every time I read an article like that, I, I kind of I, I kind of cringe a little bit, only because again I go back to my monk Fuji and say this is not the territory. This is just a map of that territory, right? And of course, when you think about uh, the internet, this is actually something that I put together. This I call this the thirty-six views of the internet, <laughs> and there's many more. Uh, taken from uh, my now pretty old website, visualcomplexity.com. And of course, when you look at the internet, you could look at the infrastructure, right, the backbone of the internet. You could look at some of the discussions that happen uh, overseeing this this uh, this uh, structure, the blogosphere. You could look at IP addresses, right, the interconnectivity between IP addresses, machines, servers. You could look at such a diversity there's such a diversity of approaches you could take when it comes to just mapping the internet that to say that one single map is what the internet looks like is immensely, immensely, of course, uh, minimal in its approach, to say the least. And finally, this is another example. This, this is actually part of a, of a, of a challenge that visualizing.org did a few years back. And I think they had this annual top challenge uh, where they would basically release the same data set and then people would use and visualize this data set in different ways. What I love about this specific challenge is that the data set is exactly the same, right? It was a challenge, the data set provided to, to uh, competitors was the same, but now look at the range of approaches from the same exact data set, right? Visualizing meteorites on planet Earth, right? Plethora of approaches altogether. So it's a really, this, is, this, by the way, is actually the winning entry in 2013 uh, for that challenge uh, alone. So again, think about this when you think about a data set. Think about your data set as your Mount Fuji. And now probably the topic for another talk would be, okay, this is great, but how can I actually know which of all these maps from my Mount Fuji is the right one? This is likely uh, the topic for another talk. But it kind of depends on a few things, primarily the type of data that you have. It depends on the context of that data, the task that the user is trying to perform. And sometimes the question or the message, the question you want to answer and the message sometimes you want to deliver, right? This is an important distinction between uh, data communication and data exploration, right? It comes really into place because sometimes you want to be more uh, opinionated into the message that you want to deliver. Sometimes you, you, you don't want to be. So it depends on a multiple variety of factors, but these kind of cover at a very high level the things you should think of when click when selecting the right map for your Mount Fuji. So thank you so much. We are out of time, but we have, of course, time for questions. I would just uh, point out that if you want to uh, actually follow me on Twitter, uh, this is my, my handle, MS Lima, M S L I M A. There's also MSLima.com. If you want to follow up, if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to like uh, answer so we can actually continue the, the conversation. Uh, and even if it's not completely related to what I just uh, presented. Then I also want to say that if you are interested in other webinars, I'm actually doing a series of webinars, uh, probably going to reconnect them after the, the summer. But if you are interested in future webinars, panels, interviews I'm going to be doing, 
uh, down the line, you can follow me on crowdcast.io slash mslima. I use the same sort of handle for everything, so that's easy, crowdcast.io slash mslima. Uh, and you can actually attend one of those uh, future webinars, panels, or interviews. And now we are, I would love to answer questions if you have. Thank you. We'll probably stop presenting so that you can, we can actually have a Whoa, there's a lot of questions. Great. Awesome. OK, so let me see here. All right, so I'm going to read the question. I think we have already a few questions here. There's like maybe eight questions from the audience. I'm going to read the question out loud, and then I'm going to answer them so that you can understand the concept the context of it. The first question is, do you think we will find a generally understandable sign that, for example, will prevent people from opening a nuclear waste repository 6,000 years from now? Wow. That's a, that's a pretty interesting question. Um, I actually love, this is, uh, you should look it up. There's research done on this. And a lot of people have tried to actually solve this challenge. It's a really, really, really important challenge. Like, how can we communicate to, with humans 6,000 years from now. If, first of all, we don't even know if humans are gonna be around by that time. We also don't know what languages will be spoken in 6,000 years, right? There's no guarantee that any of the languages spoken today will still be spoken in 6,000 years. If we look back at 600, 6,000 years ago, none of the language we speak today was spoken back then. So there's actually a strong probability that that's gonna be the case. So how can you communicate with, that far in time? How can you communicate with fellow humans that don't understand any of the languages we use today? Specifically, if you want to tell them that something is dangerous and they shouldn't touch it. And those are, of course, uh, atomic wastes, uh, wastelands, right? Those are pretty important things that, you know, these people dig massive holes on the ground. They, these are really radioactive material that lasts thousands and thousands of years. And if anyone is to dig and release that radioactive material, it could, it could be pretty problematic. So people have tried different things. They look at the concept of human universals, which is another thing that I absolutely love, right? Uh, the ideas or concepts that are universal across space and time that you can understand, that I can understand, that anyone in Asia, Africa, the US can understand Europe. Some of these are emotions facial expressions, right? So the facial expression of disgust, of anger, of happiness, these are universally understandable. It doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't even matter if you speak a language, you understand those emotions, human emotions. So they tried, one of the things that they tried first was communicating via human faces, showing some of these things, right? And where you show a series of human faces showing being angry or being just showing disgust, showing pain, right, which is another universal uh, attribute. But then I think the final decision that they decided on, on, at least on this specific experimental site, I think it was somewhere in the US, they actually did this massive metallical structures that replicate the, the thorns of a rose, right? So these are mass, super large structures and then they have like really pointy features. And the saying goes that, again, irrespectively of what language, country, culture you're part of, you are familiar with what can actually kill you in nature, right? I mean, even though many of us have lost that touch with nature, it's somehow still embedded in our genes, right? And we know that when we go out and we have very sharp edges of things, these things can actually kill you, right? Think about the thorns of a plant, think about the rough edge of, of a rock, think about the sharp teeth of an animal. We associate those things with danger. So they are trying to somehow, even though these are, are artificial structures, man-made, that hopefully in 6,000 years from now, people would look at the structures and perceive them as being dangerous because that it's replicating the same structure that nature conveys for danger. Right? It's a fascinating study. I would love to even talk to you, whoever asked that question at some other stage. It's a really, really, absolutely fascinating issue on, on how we can actually communicate to, with someone that doesn't know any language we, we understand today. 
All right, so the second question is, since you come from the field of industrial design, how did you make the step to data visualization? How does information design become became your passion? It's a good point. Um, so I was, yes, uh, my background is definitely industrial design, product, the, the original product design, not the new product design, like physical products, chairs and, and tables and so on. Then I think halfway through my course, and I was studying in the, in the faculty of Lisbon, Faculdade de Arquitetura, uh, in Portuguese, and, um, and was going halfway through my, my program, I think maybe it was like the third or fourth year, and I became fascinated by the digital. And I became fascinated by the digital because it's a much more ephemeral type of thing that you can change and you can massage immediately and show the outcome in, in a very sort of immediate way. Versus, of course, industrial design that, you know, you create something, you create a blueprint, it takes a long period of time for, you know, prototyping, for production to go up, to actually see the final object. Many times it takes months and years at times, right? So I was fascinated by the digital realm on its own, right? this ability to morph something so fast and see the outcome in a really, really quick way. And then I was doing a master's uh, of fine arts at Parsons School of Design in New York. And this was maybe 2004. And I saw this diagram by a teacher of mine called uh, the understanding spectrum, where data leads into information, information leads into knowledge, and knowledge ultimately leads into wisdom. And again, even though my background was, of course, industrial design, I was so compelled to be part of that process, to be part, to basically create a bridge between information and knowledge, right? From producers to consumers, which is the hardest thing to do in a sense, right? Because we are great at collecting data, right? Our ability to collect data has by far exceeded our ability to make sense of that data. And this is more true now than ever it was, right? With the phenomenon of big data. We have data on everything. How many times you have turned on your microwave, right? Now, the challenge is converting data and information into knowledge right? and ultimately wisdom and action. So that was really the turning point for me to that I know this is my calling. I need to like be part of this. And this was again more than 15 years ago. And since then I've been, it's been a strong passion of mine. So question three, how can we create, collect universal guidelines for the design of data visualizations? How can we communicate them effectively? That's tough. Um, that's a really good problem, a really good challenge. And I love complex challenges. Um, and that's actually... <clears throat> that's actually something that we are doing with my team at Google. So roughly last year, we actually released a set of guidelines on how to actually do data visualization in an effective way. And it was actually based on six, six primary principles. Uh, this is actually something that I also teach at times, you know, some of the principles of data visualization. But the guidelines are really important. I don't think we have done, uh, it, it's not still a very comprehensive set of guidelines. I think it's a good starting point. Uh, if you want, I can actually send you the link. It's actually external, not just internal. Anyone outside of Google can actually consume those guidelines. We did that work in partnership with the, with the material team at Google. And it's now, again, out. You know, it's out. Fast Company even did a, an article about it roughly, I think, June last year, exactly. So the guidelines are out, and I, I would encourage you to, to look it up. There's, of course, many guidelines that have been put out by different companies and, and authors and researchers. Uh, the challenge of universal guidelines is a really interesting one, and that's actually where my team is now focusing. We are trying to commit to, to make data widely accessible, right? And accessibility is a huge emphasis for us at the moment. So we hope that in, in the coming months, we're going to be able to release another set of guidelines, in this case, more pertaining to the accessibility of data, right? Because sometimes visualization is just one way you could communicate data, right? And it's important for us to think visualization is just one way. There are many other ways. And I will never forget one time that I was at, at a conference and um, I just beside me was a blind person. And, you know, in a very sort of casual conversation, you know, he, he asked me what I was there to talk about and what was my field of research. And I would never forget that day because 
I couldn't really express, I couldn't explain to this person what data visualization is or what I was going to talk about because my entire existence, my entire passion and, and work for the past few years has been based on something that he cannot see, he cannot understand what I mean by many of the, the metaphors that I would use. So it's, since that moment in time, I, that idea of, of, of making data accessible has really stuck with me. And my team now at Google, we are really trying to sort of uh, make some headway into that space. And, and hopefully we're gonna be able to release some, some guidelines soon. All right, so the next question is, what is a personal database project waiting in your desk drawer to be implemented? There's so many, there's so many projects and ideas for books and ideas for articles. Uh, I cannot even not, I can I cannot even name one, to be honest. Uh, I can tell you this, I started using Notion recently. I don't know if you use that. I I'm kind of an idea collector in many ways, if you want to call that. Uh, and for me, it's really tough because I have like all these notebooks. I'm fascinated by pens and notebooks, as I think most designers are. And I accumulate, I have so many notebooks at home that I've only used maybe two or three pages. And if I take a note annotation or an idea there, I just lose track because now all of a sudden, I already went with my latest, fanciest <laughs> new notebook and I forgot everything that was in the previous ones. So I need to keep track of that. And I've, I've been using Notion. And Notion as a tool is so great. Um, it's, of course, a cloud-based tool. And it allows me to basically keep track of many of these evolving ideas that I have. OK, so the next question is, how can you avoid an unintentionally misleading data visualizations and still publish your visualizations to get feedback unintentionally? How can you avoid unintentionally misleading data visualizations and still publish your visualizations to get feedback. I mean, I think it really goes back to the ethics of, of data visualization. And I talk about this, you know, quite often in, in webinars that I, that I give. Um, it's, it's really about, and the ethics comes, of course, it comes in the way that, you, you know, where do you actually get the data from? You know, it's about, I mean, for and foremost, it's, it's really about being transparent and being honest with the audience, right? And that honesty and transparency comes in telling them where this data came from. What is the source of this data? Be clear, you don't, you don't need to hide that, where the source came from. What manipulation occurred? This is actually the behind the scenes of a lot of data visualization projects that no one talks about. Like, because when you get the data set, sometimes people can clean the data, can manipulate, can remove things, can add things. So, explain to the audience how this data set was treated, right? And then finally, what decisions you made in for when it comes to the visual encoding of that data visualization, right? So what kind of options did you consider? Uh, why do you think this is the best one, right? Explain the process, right? I think it's, it's your obligation. It's, all, it's your ethical duty when you put out a data visualization for the general public. Of course, it's, it's also the duty on the audience to be inquisitive and be uh, suspicious, right, by default, as you should be by seeing any piece of journalistic media. But it's also your duty as a data visualizer to be honest and transparent about everything from the data, from being transparent about the data you're using and how it was treated and how finally it was encoded into graphics. Okay, question number six is, as you studied quite intensively how diseases spread and how complex networks form, what were you expecting, hoping to see in terms of people behavior during the current COVID pandemic? Wow, that's a really important thing. Ha, huh. I was expecting the same. Uh, it's, it's so remarkable how, and I think this is very frustrating for historians as well, that no matter how much you bring to light about specific events that happened in the past, as a means for us to understand and you know, prevent certain actions to happen in the present, we keep doing it. it it's almost we are, we are, we are, we are this memoryless uh, uh, child, right? There's no conception of the past completely. And this is at a time where we have all the information we could retrieve from past events. And this is not about, just about COVID, this is about 
political systems. This is about a variety of different things. We have so many things that have gone wrong in the past and we keep repeating them, right? And I am always um, amazed, but not completely surprised that that's the case. I think it really goes down to, to human nature. You know, there's this idea of presentism, right? That we are at the pinnacle of civilization and this is the only time that matters and everything that happened in the past is irrelevant. And I, of course, fight again. I fight constantly against this, this bias, this way of thinking. But it's unfortunately a way of thinking that perverses humankind and it incapacitates us from actually learning from the past and avoiding past mistakes and we see that happen all, all the time all the time next question is uh what would you advise someone who has children like you it's, it's not easy <laughs> a job that takes a lot out of you absolutely and on the side absolutely wants to start a passion project how can they start now, I used to say that you should always have a passion project, and I think it's still the case. Uh, I, of course, can understand that with kids, everything becomes hard. It does become hard, I say, and I'm speaking with someone that I, I was just locked in the two bedroom for three months in New York with two young kids, two girls, five and two. It was not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And I know it's hard, but I think when my first daughter, Chloe, was born, um, one of the things that I felt is that I became more focused on, on work, right? I knew that I didn't have the luxury of spending as much time browsing stuff that doesn't matter as I had before, right? So whatever time I had, if it was one hour, if it was two hours, I had to be really, really sharp focused and make that time worth it, right? And I think you, if you take that approach, even with kids, if you have one hour, but if you really make that hour count, right? I think you can still make some headway in the areas that you care, that are interesting to you, right? Yes, you need to be disciplined, you need to be rigorous about your methodology, about your schedule, but I think it's still very possible. And in fact, I would absolutely encourage you to try, even if it's, even if it's like half an hour every day. It's impressive how small things add up. If you take half an hour every day and build something, by the end of the month, that's a lot of hours, right? That's a substantial amount of time and work that you put together. And by the end of the month, you could have something that you can probably feel proud of. And it might not be final, but it's a good step in the right direction, right? So, and then again, I, I would totally encourage you to have a passion project. Uh, I mean, for me, just from experience, it's by following my passion and having these side projects that led me to happiness. It's, 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 of course, I think the nine to five job was important and I made a lot of friends through that process, but it really gave me a lot of joy, most of the joy from a work perspective. For the most part, have been my passion projects. So I, I totally encourage you to do that, even if you have kids. <laughs> Question eight, from a data set, including a lot of detailed variables to the final visualization, which are, in your experience, not theory-based, the most important steps and challenges from a data set, including a lot of detail. Okay, so let me read that again. From a data set, including a lot of detailed variables to the final visualization, which are, in your experience, not theory-based, the most important steps and challenges? I mean, I think the most, I wouldn't, yeah, I think the most critical challenge by far is the part of visual encoding, right? It's that, I don't think that's, that's where the genius comes in or the things that are really hard to quantify, right? And when you see the great visualizations are the ones that explore completely new visual metaphors that you were not expecting. So I think the element of creativity or genius, if you want to call it, happens in that part of visual encoding. But it's also why it's so hard, because again, like you look at some of the reference guides that I showed, there's so many different chart types you could pick, right? It, it kind of leads you to analysis paralysis, right? To this idea that I actually have another principal webinar on this, which is the Fitz law, right? The more options you have, the more time it takes for you to make a decision, right? And I think you become paralyzed by just not the sheer number of chart types you could pick, which is really daunting if you think about it. So I think that's one of the challenges and that's why the visual encoding part is so uh, hard. Also because when you do a data visualization, it is normally 
for a specific audience. Right. And this is actually an aspect that not a, a lot of people highlight in, in, the, in, the, in our field. So understanding your users, right? Understanding the needs of those users and understanding if your specific visual model or representation fits into what they understand, into what they need and what, what they require, the task that they, they have to, to complete is a critical, critical aspect. And that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of trial and error as with most elements of design, right? You're not designing just this for yourself, right? You're not just designing something because it's cool. At least you should not be doing that. <laughs> you should be designing to solve a problem of someone that someone has, right? Uh, or convey a specific message. So there's a specific audience that you have to consider. And that trial and error, that discussion, that end holding takes a good amount of time, again, to pick. So I would say the visual encoding is, is by far the hardest one to get right. I think we might, wow, we have a lot of questions. So let me see if we can get maybe two more, up to 10 questions. Um, question nine, Manuel, do you think a chart should have instructions or should be as clean as possible, requiring more intuition from the reader? Wow, that is quite the question. Um, I think there's there's almost like two different schools of thought, if you want to uh, give that. Uh, one of them that says that any explanation is a sign of bad design, right? If you are to explain how this UI work, works, how this specific visualization works, it's already a failure. It's the assumption of failure, right? In the sense that you didn't do your job properly. Because that school of thought believes that you know what? Design should be all intuitive for whatever that person is consuming it. And I think that's that's a very beautiful sort of notion. And so it's, a, it's a beautiful school of thought in many ways. And I think it's a school of thought that pushes you for simplicity, for minimalism, for the essence of an object of design, right? Uh, Dieter Rams and, and all those great designers were inspired by that school of thought, right? Now, on the other side, you have a school of thought that says, you know, Sometimes design are complex and we live in a complex world. Not everything can be as simple as a chair, right? So sometimes you are creating a visualization or um, a piece of design that is immensely complex and people should be and all the to the process, right? They should be, um, they should be sort of, they should be told about how these things work to make their lives easier. I mean, to be honest, I kind of feel I'm I'm kind of like in between these two different schools of thought. Uh, I think I'm always I love this quote that by this Dutch designer that says, "I'm a functionalist troubled by aesthetics." <laughs> I'm a functionalist troubled by aesthetics, and I feel that way, and I feel kind of in between the schools of thought because on one. On one side, I always strive for simplicity and, again, creating something that doesn't require explanation. But I think it's it's naive to think that that's always the case for everything, right? And I will tell you an example, an example being that sometimes if you really want to be bold, if you want to be creative, you are likely going to explore visual metaphors that we haven't done before, right? And that's the only way for us to face some of the challenges that we have today, okay? So if you want to be bold, if you want to be creative, if you want to come up with a completely new visualization model, you're going to have to explain to people how it works because they have never seen it before, right? There's always going to be an implicit learning curve, okay? So you can think about Ari Back, you know, the famous designer who did engineer, in fact, uh, with a design heart or brain, if you want to say it. Um, Ari Back in 1933 created a whole different way of visualizing the, the, under, the underground map in London, right? That was not based on geography. When that map came out in 1933, at the very top, at the very back of that map, it said, this is a brand new map. We are welcoming your feedback and, and your thoughts. Uh, constantly, when people came up with new metaphors, right? When new things came out, they would have to explain people. And if you don't do that, right, you would never truly gonna innovate. And of course, you don't need to explain what a bar chart sometimes it is or a bar chart because it's so, it's so common. People understand it, but you cannot stuck that uh, in that world alone, right? People read best what they read the most. But if you really want to diverge, if you really want to create and be original and create something completely new, and I think we we have to invest 
in new visual metaphors to face the growing complexities of modern times. Some of these complex scenarios, like understanding cities, understanding the brain, understanding ecosystems, cannot be represented by the metaphors we have used in the past, like a bar chart or a pie chart. So you're going to have to get out of your, your comfort zone, out of your box, and innovate. And for you to innovate, you're going to have to continue to explain to people how this new metaphor works. So I will treat that in a bit more nuanced way and say that sometimes there's a middle within those two schools of thoughts that you, you probably should consider. All right, so I'm just going to take one more question, number 10. And then I'm happy to either follow up by on Twitter. We can do like a, ask me anything on Twitter or follow up uh, by email. So the last question, question number 10 is, after trees and circles, which shapes would motivate you to write a book? <laughs> All right, this is a, this is a fun question. Uh, I don't know. Well, I tell you this, my wife and friends keep teasing me that what's going to be your next book? Is it going to be the book of triangles, the book of squares? Um, I don't think I'm as motivated for any of those shapes. Uh, I think really, if, you, if I look back, uh, and there's actually some research I can point you, uh, both the tree, the network, and the circle are the, true, the three more fascinating visual metaphors ever. And I think I've exhausted my passion for those types of symbols and visual metaphors, which, by the way, are absolutely universal. Okay. We can go into that in detail in another, in another webinar, in another talk. But I think I've exhausted my, my three uh, uh, universal visual metaphors, being the tree, the, the network, and the circle. I think now, I mean, I don't know if you know the, the work of Bruno Munari. He actually explored many other shapes like that. So you, you can look at, at his work for, for that. Um, I, I have ideas, many ideas for what comes next, but I think I, I've probably, uh, I'm, it's not going to be about a shape specifically. I can tell you that. <laughs> at least for now, you never know. Maybe like in 20 years, I'm going to do, uh, do a, the book of triangles. <laughs> so, so stay tuned. All right, everyone. So I will just like to thank you all for attending this, this talk. It was a pleasure. And I can answer some of the other questions, uh, again, either by Twitter or email. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hey, Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining and taking that time. Uh, it was amazing. It was so much good information. I have to digest first, and I think a lot of the audience as well. Uh, yeah, it was a great pleasure to having you here. And what else to say? We just have one more announcement after I say goodbye to you. So everybody stay tuned for a moment. And first, I, we can't do a lot of applause. <laughs> it, was, it was great to be here. And, uh, and thank you so much for the, for the invite, Caroline. Pleasure. <laughs> we, OK, so my turn to give the awesome news. So we couldn't let you go before uh, releasing more good news. So in two weeks, we'll have Isabel Meirelles. So save the date. <laughs> and on the 1st of July, we will have her for, for another talk. It will be awesome. And stay tuned. Join us. Comment. Uh, leave a comment here or on Twitter. Feel free to reach us, OK? So see you next time. Bye bye. 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 bye.